today is called Sheltering in Nature, uh, basically transforming an ordinary backyard into a pollinator habitat and an opportunity for nature photography. Uh, Patrick Lynch is an uh, award-winning photographer, illustrator, and author, and we are very excited to have him with us today. Um, I don't want to eat up into too much of his time. We've got about 30 people with us right now. The program is being recorded, so if you have to step away and come back, um, we will be posting the link somewhere in social media, is maybe emailing it out um, at some point at a later date. Um, so stay tuned for that. And without further ado, I will pass the torch to you, Patrick. Okay, thank you very much. Um, uh, we'll do the share screen tango here just to make sure everything is okay. I'll flip into slide mode. And uh, do you see a, a full screen of the title slide? So, yes, we do. Yes. Okay, great. Okay, thanks very much for, for having me to speak. Um, I started uh, this sort of project to improve our yard um, a number of years ago. And of course, because of the pandemic and the weirdness of the last few years, had more time to bring to it. I was originally inspired by um, a number of books of Doug, Doug Tallamy's, uh, Bringing Nature Home, um, uh, The Living Landscape, etc. cetera. Um, I should uh, uh, admit upfront that I am no master gardener. Uh, no heavy duty gardener would be especially impressed with our lawn or anything. Um, uh, uh, the point being that there are lots of ways to enjoy a landscape that's a lot friendlier for wildlife. And, um, and you don't have to either spend a fortune or have your yard look as if it was somehow abandoned um, in order to uh, do much better. I love Tallamy's idea in his latest book um, uh, of a homegrown national park. As I'll explain, um, the, uh, we've lost 50% of the world's wildlife in the last uh, few decades. So, and that applies to insects too, things like butterflies, bees and whatnot. So Tallamy's idea was if we all do, do our bit to make our yards a bit more friendly for wildlife, that we can help ease that crisis. And it really is a crisis in terms of um, what they call the, say, the insect holocaust. When I used to drive down to Florida to go birding and whatnot back in starting, say, in the mid 70s, uh, uh, one of the things you had to make sure you had with you was lots of paper towels and lots of Windex because driving down 95 in Florida, um, you'd have to stop like every couple of hours or something just to get all the bugs off your windscreen. There were that many bugs. And um, most of the, the big things you would hit were dragonflies, just just uncountable millions of dragonflies and whatnot. Now, when I go down to Florida, I still love to. This is um, uh, just outside of the Kennedy Space Center um, uh, in Merritt Island. Absolutely gorgeous place. I can go all day driving around Central Florida and have maybe one or two bug strikes. Uh, I can go into these uh, uh, mangrove marsh areas uh, around Merritt Island, around the Kennedy Space Center, and not get a single bug bite all day. Uh, I don't know where they went. Uh, the, the subject is complex, but we are living through uh, what really is an insect holocaust. And so even, uh, even small things that we can do to make uh, the... Uh, the world a friendlier place for things like bees and butterflies and other wildlife, it seems to me worthwhile. And I'll explain what we did with our yard. Um, uh, not very expensive, not very ambitious. Uh, basically, mostly what we did was stop mowing so much. So um, uh, this is the ideal. 
is you go out and you you have a bazillion um, beautiful wildflowers in your backyard and the bees and butterflies love it. Um, the secret fear, I think, when you talk to people about not mowing so much is that, you know, your yard's going to look like it was designed by Boo Radley and the place will look abandoned and that it doesn't have to be that way at all. One of the things you should start off thinking about when you look at your own yard is look at it like an ecosystem, uh, because it is. Uh, look at the general landscape um, and geography around your yard. Uh, think about and maybe make an inventory and notes about what kind of wildlife you already have and what habitats that you can very readily supply them without doing anything that's terribly expensive. I live in North Haven, Connecticut, which is about 10 miles uh, directly north of downtown New Haven. And so that's our landscape context. I, I want more butterflies, I want more bees, I want more wildlife in general, uh, birds, et cetera. Um, but there are certain things uh, because of the location of our house that I'm just never going to have. I love dragonflies. I love to photograph them, love to go out and find them. Uh, but we're never going to have dragonflies where I live because we're about at least a mile away from any open natural uh, water course. Uh, we're up on a ridge. So um, we get dragonflies um, in transition. They go by from time to time. But that's what I mean about being realistic about your context. There are lots of things we can have. Um, dragonflies are not going to be one of them unless we got into something really expensive and elaborate, like an artificial pond or something, which we're not going to do. Um, our house is fairly conventional. We have a big lawn out front. And as I say, no master gardener would be um, bowled over by our house or our gardens. Um, they're not very elaborate. Uh, the context, as I said, is we're on a ridge line. This is our house right here. That's Sleeping Giant State Park behind him. The uh, vertical scale here is exaggerated a bit just so you can see the hills more easily. But we're up on the western ridge of New England's Central Valley. Um, uh, people call it around here the Quinnipiac Valley or further north, um, the Connecticut River Valley. It's not I don't want to go into geology too much, but it's not actually a river valley. Um, it's a rift valley that formed when Africa and Europe pulled apart um, uh, from what later became North America and the Atlantic Ocean started forming. So the Quinnipiac is down below us here. We're up high on a ridge. And as I say, we're at least a mile from any fresh, fresh water or water course or stream or anything. So we're dry. Um, even in summers that were a little bit more moderate than our really bone dry drought, um, droughty summer of 2002, we still don't have a lot of water. Um, so that's something we need to think about, uh, my wife and I, as we look around the yard and think of the kinds of ways, as I say, without spending a fortune, without getting into something very elaborate that we can do to make our house friendlier. And uh, I'll describe some of the things we've done. We start off with some natural advantages. We've got um, almost two acres of a suburban lot, and um, it's mostly um, boring old conventional lawn. The only thing I can say in our defense is that in the 25 years we've owned the house, we have never poisoned our lawn with anything and never fertilized it either. Um, stays nice and green out front because that's where our leaching field is. Um, we have uh, a number of trees. We're fortunate to have a big sugar maple and then a bunch of silver maples um, on the north edge of the property. And um, uh, behind the property, we've got uh, a hedgerow. And as usual with untended hedgerows these days, it's, it's uh, the basic structure is native plants, but it's also loaded with invasives like bittersweet and porcelain berry and stuff like that. I don't mind it because um, although it drives me a bit crazy when I look at it all, uh, the, the animals love it. Um, it's great shelter for them as I'll describe later. So we don't go crazy with um, trying to beat back the invasives. 
because um, we don't have infinite time or money to get involved in that sort of stuff. Mostly what we did to transform our yard is uh, work on some of the flower beds that were already established around the house and make them uh, a, a lot more pollinator friendly, bringing in uh, uh, wherever possible native or near native uh, cultivars of things like cone flowers and black eyed Susan and salvia and um, uh, Joe pie weed, um, other kinds of things that are very attractive to butterflies and bees and uh, things like that. As I said, mostly we just stopped mowing things. We created what we call these pollinator areas or pollinator beds, which all I did was stop mowing that area. I mow around it all the time. So they're nice and trim. Uh, nothing looks like it's been abandoned or overgrown. Um, it's obviously a very deliberate uh, uh, a flower bed in these areas here. And I did not, some people rototill them and do elaborate sort of stuff. I didn't do that. As you'll see, I have spiked um, some of the pollinator areas like um, you can see it in the background here with uh, garden center plants, not, you know, just like Home Depot level garden center plants, uh, Joe Pie weed, uh, Black Eyed Susans, we already had a lot of, so I mostly just get more of those by transplanting some of them. Lots of cone flowers, asters in the fall, et cetera, and loads and loads of Joe Pie weed because every, almost everybody who's into gardening has heard of butterfly bushes and they do attract a lot of butterflies. But you know what? Joe Pie weed is native and it attracts just as many butterflies as butterfly bush. So um, let me back up a little bit. The, um, the area you're looking at is at the top of the screen here. That is um, a natural low area in the yard that used to flood. We had that uh, ripped out, put gravel and a drainage system in there and then covered everything back up probably about 10 years ago or so. And so it's a natural bioswale. We um, uh, uh, keep the lawn sort of narrow here. So there's plenty of stuff. When we have very heavy rains, it can all drain out here. And now it drains right into one of these pollinator beds. So, and then there's a, the sort of um, hedgerow between our yards uh, back here. So even in the heaviest rains, nothing reaches the street because the plants all absorb it all and it goes into the groundwater. Um, just a, a, a close up of that pollinator bed. This um, probably shot last September or so, the asters are out. And, um, and it, as I say, it makes a great, if you've got a low area, and, and have drainage problems, you can plant things that are friendlier there. And it acts like um, a, a perfect natural sponge and, and absorbs a lot of stuff. Um, this is uh, one of the side beds on the south edge of our property. It looks a little tatty here because you can't really see much of the mode area. Again, um, I don't just let things grow like crazy. Uh, I don't want to um, offend our neighbors too much, et cetera. Um, so everything is trimmed and, and has hard edges. We still have lots of lawn. We can play bocce and croquet and whatever. Uh, uh, but um, within these beds, aside from spiking them with some garden center plants, just to get things going and make them a, a bit more attractive, especially to bees and butterflies, that's all I did. I just stopped mowing them. So we're trying to create a balanced environment. We're into birds, we're into butterflies, we're into bees and other kinds of insects, pollinator insects, et cetera. And, and, and so we started off thinking about those things, but we got lots of other wildlife as well. Uh, the local foxes and even a couple of bobcats in the area just love that really thick tangled hedgerow at the back of our yard. And they use that to transit through neighborhoods. We didn't start off thinking we're gonna build a nice friendly habitat for the local red-tailed hawks, but um, the field mice love the pollinator beds, these unmowed beds and the, the red-tailed hawks love the field mice. So when we, uh, again, thought about our yard, thinking about it 
really as an ecology, thinking about it not only in terms of what kinds of advantages do we have, what kinds of things like brush pile, rock piles, and other kinds of things um, that we might have. We don't really have any dust beds and grit. Birds like those kinds of things. We certainly do feeding in the wintertime. Um, these are all dimensions you can think of when you're planting and planning the yard. One nice thing about yards is that they form a natural ecotone. That's an ecologist way of describing this transition between open areas, say like wild grasslands and whatnot, and then shrubs and trees gradually transitioning into forest. And they are very rich in wildlife because you get a mix of all of these environments together. So they happen to be very rich in wildlife. So effectively, we've used some of our pollinator beds to create ecotones between, say, that really built up the trees and, and, and tall shrubs in the hedgerow and, um, and our open mowed lawn. Brush piles, um, wildlife just love. So uh, the, the foxes, the woodchucks, um, the field mice, all kinds of other things, just love the kind of shelter there that you can get. So if you've got winter kill and yard cleanup and whatnot, you could think about designated some de designating some area of your yard. Uh, uh, we use, just use the hedgerow. I pile stuff into the hedgerow and it creates yet more sheltered habitat. We also think about uh, what the yard is like for wildlife in the winter, in the spring. Uh, we do f have multiple feeders in the winter, um, in the colder months. But I also try to think about the profile of the mostly perennials that we plant, uh, mostly native perennials, so that there's something blooming as long as possible. Uh, one thing that really helps is to keep a journal. When I first started doing this, and, and I'm a very active photographer, as you'll see as well, is um, uh, we'd have uh, a, a beautiful, say, June day. I'd be out in the yard with my camera. There'd be lots of things blooming. And I feel feeling like, okay, we're all dressed up and nobody's here. Uh, where are all the butterflies? Where are all the bees? Well, it takes a while, um, particularly in our particular environment, for, for all of those things to get rolling. We get early bees and early butterflies like morning cloaks and, and things, although not so many morning cloaks because we don't really have a forest per se. We just have groups of trees. Uh, but um, I, I've several years of keeping a yard journal taught me that the big butterflies, the really large numbers of bees and skippers and other kinds of things really in our yard don't get going until uh, probably early to mid-July. And uh, we'll have lots of stuff until at least early to mid-October. But um, in the springtime, we have lots of flowers and for whatever reason, uh, not that many insects. I think it just takes a while for, for the ecology to get rolling. So um, uh, the, we're interested in, you know, the same things most people are interested in if you're into butterflies and whatnot, big monarchs and swallowtails. We've, um, I don't, I probably have at least 30 uh, uh, relatively common butterflies um, on our yard list. We get all the swallowtails, we get fritillaries, we get other, other more exotic things. Buckeyes are a little bit exotic for us, um, but we do get them sporadically from time to time. So it really helps to uh, have some record because from year to year, it's hard to remember that June is not such a great time, but by July, uh, things will be a lot more interesting. One of the things we've thought about and that can be almost as attractive as feeding birds in the winter is supplying water. Um, birds just love water. And one thing, um, uh, a tip that um, uh, we gradually learned about as we go is put uh, gravel, clean gravel into your bird feeders because a lot of bird feeders are too deep for birds. You can see birds doing all kinds of acrobatics to keep from falling in to water that's much too deep for them to be able to stand on. So uh, for butterflies, um, we have butterflies and bees that come to our, our uh, um, uh, 
bird fountains as well. Uh, uh, but I, I bank up some gravel so that they can stand in the shallow water and drink, and they really seem to appreciate that. So you'll hear a lot about why native plants are so much better than um, uh, the run-of-the-mill um, wide variety of things you can find in garden centers. And it's because if you want the butterflies, you have to feed the caterpillars. And in this case, say, if you want more great spangled fritillaries, uh, you need wild violets around. Um, their caterpillars feed on wild violets. Unfortunately, in our yard, we don't really have the open kind of foresty areas that are very friendly for wild violets, but we do have a few violets. I always um, am very careful to mow and clip around them so that um, so they don't get trampled in the general scheme of things. But um, there are tight correlations between the types of plants you want. For example, if you want more of various kinds of swallowtails, you plant things like asparagus. Whether or not you're going to harvest asparagus and eat it in, in your vegetable garden, if you plant asparagus, you'll have more uh, uh, swallowtails because swallowtails love, swallowtail caterpillars love asparagus plants to feed on. And uh, there are uh, whole charts you can find of what kind of butterflies um, you're interested in and what their caterpillars feed on. The Xerxes Society uh, has excellent books out there. You can find them in Amazon and wherever that will uh, tell you all about what to plant and how to plant it, um, especially if you decided that your yard is realistically someplace that might be attractive for, for particular species uh, um, and what to plant. So um, as I say, the nightmare is uh, your your whole beautiful yard's, yard's going to end up like a terrible mescaline salad, and um, and it'll be dismal, uh, even if the bugs love it. And it's not that way at all. There are gorgeous native plants out there, like butterfly weed, milkweed, and other kinds of, of plants, um, lots of different cone flowers, uh, joe pie weed, salvia, all kinds of things you can plant that look great. And, uh, uh, and, and so it's, um, we haven't found it to be any sort of aesthetic compromise to be uh, friendlier to stuff. You do have to be tolerant. Um, you know, our, our gardens are not going to be mistaken for anything um, uh, from Versailles. They're not very uh, gardened. We leave them in a wild tangle deliberately in these pollinator patches uh, all year. Even, even though they don't look that great in the wintertime, uh, because uh, in the winter, um, overwintering are all those pupae of the butterflies that are going to become next year's butterflies and things. So those wild, unmolested uh, um, grassland habitats are critical for increasing the number of bees and butterflies and other things you get. But you still have a beautiful yard. We have lots of, in this case, it was late in the summer or last summer. So lots and lots, probably uh, my wife thinks too many uh, black eyed Susans, but nevertheless, um, I, I love black eyed Susans because they bloom for about three solid months and they're bulletproof. Uh, I don't water them or anything else. They're even more tolerant than cone flowers, which is another really bulletproof thing. And they're beautiful. One of the nice things, and if there's anything we can claim to, which might set the way we do gardening as opposed to um, uh, other people, is just look very closely at all the marvels that you get, even from fairly modest uh, plantings of native flowers and things that are attractive for pollinators and butterflies, is um, we have beautiful, albeit small, albeit simple gardens. And as a photographer, I just love it. So I don't find that we made any great compromises. You'd drive by our house on the street, and never recognize that it's any different than any of the other um, houses on the street. Most of our pollinator patches are in the backyard and side yard, so they're not terribly visible. Uh, um, and so, you know, but... Um, uh, even the modest level of things that we've done have had a tremendous payoff in terms of the sheer range 
of things that we see. And it just um, amazes me that I can walk outside literally just feet from my door and find these incredible alien world, wildlife worlds that are just right there. Um, you just have to look closely. You don't have to be really into photography and close up and all that sort of stuff. But just looking at and appreciating the the um, uh, the bees and butterflies and whatnot can be a, a wonderful experience, even if the scope of things in your yard is fairly modest. People sometimes ask me how many times I've been stung. I have never been stung when I've been photographing uh, bees, even very close, even inches from them. Uh, you just have to move slowly, carefully, deliberately. Uh, it's, um, they're busy. They don't want to sting you. Um, it's stinging you is suicide for, for um, most uh, bees. So um, I've never been stung. It's not a dangerous thing to look closely at things. Uh, just don't swat them. Don't um, make sudden movements that might that they might interpret as as threatening. Um, and as I say, we didn't start off thinking we're going to make um, a uh, a woodchuck garden. Uh, but when the yard gets more friendly, when there's more shelter for them, when frankly, there's more food from them, you get lots of other things that you didn't necessarily intend. Our cottontails, we've always had cottontails, but now that they've got so much more shelter, even out in the lawn areas, um, we have more cottontails and we see them a lot more often. Uh, wood, um, um, uh, as I say, woodchucks, um, uh, chipmunks, all kinds of other things and field mice, uh, and, um, much to um, our, the local red tails love the fact that there's a lot more field mice, um, the squirrels, etc. There's just a lot more shelter for things. Um, uh, uh, you'll hear a lot of bad mouthing um, uh, uh, among people who are into pollinators about things like uh, a butterfly bush. We have from years and years, probably at least a half a dozen substantial butterfly bushes. I'd certainly never consider removing them. Um, you'll get just as many pollinators and, and um, it's much more friendly to caterpillars if you plant things like Joe pie weed, but um, even things like, um, oh, oh, in the, uh, the rap about uh, butterfly bush is that although mature butterflies love them, almost no native caterpillars feed on them. So it's a food desert in terms of um, young uh, caterpillars and things. The older adults love them and, and they do indeed draw in things. So I'd never consider removing ours. Um, here's a um, snowberry clearwing moth. There, there are a lot more things out there than I realized, and I'm reasonably knowledgeable about natural history. But once I started keeping a yard list, I was astounded at how much stuff there is out there. I, I knew about snowberry clearwings. Uh, it's a moth that imitates a, a bumblebee. Um, so it's a true moth, but uh, they look like bumblebees. And if you're not paying attention, you might not even notice them just because your mental map sort of registers them as bumblebee. Um, and unless you're tracking bumblebees, you might not notice them, but they're, uh, so of course we have carpenter bees, we have bumblebees, we have honeybees. Uh, what I didn't realize is that we've got 20 other species of bees in our yard that I never even knew were there until I actually started looking and pay, paying attention to them. So as an artist, as an illustrator, as a photographer, uh, the yard, even at its modest scale, uh, in, in terms of our, our uh, accommodations to, to wild animals, um, is, is wonderfully inspirational. I just uh, virtually every day in the summertime, I, I have a camera close to the door and I go out and I look at what's in the yard. It's just a wonderful experience. And sometimes it's a weird experience. <laughs> yes. um, a couple of years ago, my wife came running and said, grab the camera, you're not gonna believe this. And there were two different um, large clutches of wild turkeys out in the yard, we get lots of wild turkeys. They love the bird seed that the birds kick out of the feeders and whatnot. And 
Um, I'm not sure what had caused them to do it, but um, this this whole several flocks of of um, big hens and their chicks were up sitting on the pool fence. So as I said, we thought about butterflies and bees and things when we put in all the plantings and stopped mowing so much, but we got lots of other interesting stuff instead, or, or in addition to. So um, we get lots of kinds of honeybees. There's not just one kind, there are multiple kinds, at plus a whole lot of things that I had never even heard of before, longhorn bees and um uh, sweat bees, these bicolored sweat beads. These guys are tiny. They're only maybe five, seven millimeters long. Um, in our yard, we call them sparkle bees because they're very brightly colored. Uh, but they're all out there. I had, I, I had never even heard of European wool carter bee uh, before, but um, they're out there. Uh, um, pugnacious leaf cutter bees. I don't find them very pugnacious. They seem just as friendly as any other sort of bee. But if you make your yard a little bit more friendly and you pay attention to what's out there gradually over a year or two or three, you start getting um, a very diverse set of wildlife around. Um, my wife hates thistles for obvious reasons. If you've ever stepped on backed into one, uh, bull thistles, they're not native, they're considered invasive and they very much are. But you know what? Um, butterflies love them, bees love them, goldfinches love them. So uh, and I let, um, I deliberately let bull thistles, um, at least a half dozen of them get big in our yard because they're a real magnet for, for all kinds of small wildlife. And as I say, the um, uh, goldfinches nest late in the season and they'll use uh, thistle down and seeds from bull thistles to both make their nests and feed. And they just love them. So um, it's, it's even if you're not crazy about um, it, either because it's not a native plant or because it's painful to step on, um, consider that uh, letting a few of them survive because uh, the the um, lots of different things the bees the butterflies the the goldfinches just love them. I like to play out in the yard. Um, I'll go out there with my camera. And one day last summer, I was um, literally almost sitting in the flower bed and uh, taking close ups of skippers and things. And I thought. What does the world look like from a skipper's point of view? And so I started sort of burying the camera. Some of these are iPhone shots, which happens to have a very wide angle lens. I went and got a wide angle lens instead of the, the normal um, macro telephotos that I use for close-ups. And it was just fun to try to imagine what the garden looks like from an insect's point of view. Um, and so there are all kinds of ways you can appreciate what's going on out there uh, besides, you know, just having nice bunches of flower beds and whatnot. So um, I'll explain a little bit. Wendy mentioned that um, people might want to know a bit about how I photograph things. Uh, uh, most of the insect photos that you're looking at were taken with various kinds of flash. Uh, to supplement the available light, because there's no way that I could get this much depth of field that is the sharpness all the way through uh, um, uh, the whole photograph here. Um, this, this skipper, this whole scene is maybe an inch and a half across. So it's very small. And most of that would be kind of blurry, even if, if you know, even if they say the head and the eyes were sharp. Uh, without supplemental light that I get from a flash. And um, for years and years, I've used ring lights. It's a kind of flash that fits over the front of the lens and uh, gives you the advantages. It gives you beautiful, even uh, fairly shadowless light. And the disadvantage is it gives you fairly even shadowless light. So um, the, the, the wrap on ring lights can be that although they make macro photography, 
in many ways a lot more interesting. They can leave things a little bit flat looking. So um, in the last year, I switched over to another kind of a lens mounted flash system. And you can buy these things off the shelf. I've bought it at Amazon. This flash setup costs, I think, I don't know, maybe $150 or something, which is in the general range of, of uh, professional flashes. Um, it's mounted on my Sigma 105 macro lens. I love this Sigma lens for a couple of different reasons. Um, I Most of my camera bodies are what they call two thirds uh, camera bodies. Um, mostly I'm using the Canon 90D these days. This happens to be a Rebel T T6S, but um, it's a two third sensor. That is the sensor size is about two thirds the size of a conventional 35 millimeter frame. And so uh, lenses tend to um, have a bit more telephoto to them. So a 105 millimeter lens is the equivalent in classic 35 millimeter photography of about a 160 millimeter lens. And that's perfect for bugs because this lens will photograph from infinity to one-to-one -to -one with no extension tubes or anything else. So it's very flexible. And with the flash, it just makes up a, a perfect combination for, for macro photography. So I've got this set up just sitting by the door all the time. And I, um, you know, when I'm done with breakfast, I'll grab the camera and go out and look at what's in the garden today. Um, it's usually very rewarding. Um, your camera does get covered with pollen, which I forgot to brush off, but um, uh, it's a very flexible setup. Uh, and, uh, but you don't need super stuff. Most uh, if you've got a 35 millimeter camera, um, uh, most zoom lenses these days will do some sort of macro. You may not be able to get this close to a honeybee, but um, uh, you may be able to get close enough um, uh, uh, for your needs. Uh, but you could only do this kind of photography with flash. It tends to have a hard edged uh, uh, look to it. And if you don't like bugs, um, it, it can be a little, a little harsh. Uh, but um, I, uh, for the purposes of my books and other things, I want these these um, insects, even though they're very very small. This is this whole scene is maybe only slightly more than an inch across. So actually, probably less than that because these these sweat bees are, are tiny. They're only seven or eight millimeters long. Um, uh, so, but um, I do lots of other kinds of things. You can do um, uh, uh, photography with just about anything from your iPhone to um, uh, small um, portable cameras. They don't have to be super expensive SLR cameras. I happen to have them anyway, because I've been a professional photographer for 50 something years. Um, but uh, uh, I don't always use flash. Um, uh, I get much softer effects and other kinds of things. And sometimes that's exactly what I'm looking for in, in the case of uh, photography out in the garden. So um, you don't need super expensive cameras to do this. And there are all kinds of ways to appreciate things. If you don't look, if you don't like the really hard edge look of flash photography, don't use it. Um, lots of times I don't either, and I'm looking for these various, um, uh, uh, very soft and, and sort of colorful with out of, focus, out of focus backgrounds and whatnot. And if we have done anything in our yard, which is a little bit different than the average, it might be that we just look a whole lot more closely at what's going on out there that um, I appreciate it every day. I love going out and looking at what happens to be there in the morning or the afternoon. Um, and um, probably early morning, uh, early to mid morning, once it's warmed up a bit and late afternoon are the best times to go out. And there's always something new there, even though I go out virtually every day. Uh, um, I, I encounter new things. And even after probably five years of doing this intensively, I'm still finding new things that I had no idea 
were in the yard. So thanks very much for um, inviting me to speak. And I'm happy to answer questions um, uh, if you uh, if you have questions either about the plantings or how we handle the yard or about photography. So thank you very much. Thank you, Patrick. Um, if anybody has any questions, you can use the chat box to pop your questions into the chat box. And we actually don't have any questions in the chat box at the moment. Uh, Judd did actually make a comment about uh, living in central Florida in the 70s. He said a large part of the windshield problem was the love bug, which came into Florida from South America and had no predators. And they took over the state. And the state now has them under control, hence cleaner windshields. <laughs> well, um, I don't mind cleaner windshields, but I'm just wondering where all the dragonflies and other things went. Um, cause I, I have seen the changes. It's not just a, a windshield problem and not just a love bug problem, but, um, uh, yeah, is, um, I, I think anything we can do to make our yards a bit more friendly for the insects out there are fine. And, and by the way, none of these changes increased, um, the ticks in the yard where we don't have very many deer, uh, thank goodness, um, and although we have white-footed deer mouse and other kinds of things, we've been lucky. I, I uh, almost never see ticks in our yard. If our dog gets ticks, it's from uh, going out to Sleeping Giant or something. It's not from our yard. And same thing with um, mosquitoes. So no more biting insects or other kinds of things. And as I say, although I've gotten very, very close many, many times to uh, to uh, wild bees, I've never been stung. Um, Janet had a question. She wanted to know what your thoughts are about euonymus. I'm assuming she means the winged euonymus firebush plant. Yeah, it's um, uh, it's pretty. Um, you see it. Um, I see it out in the woods all the time. Uh, it's very noticeable, especially in the fall. Um, uh, you know, it's one of those things that if you really, really love it and you're into gardening and, and you, um, you know, groom your yard well enough so that it's not likely to escape. Um, I don't have any religious views about non-natives if that's your thing, but um, it's not helpful to, to bees and butterflies and, and local wildlife aside from maybe uh, providing some shelter. Uh, because it's not native. Um, and so we don't have any, and I wouldn't go out and plant any, because if I had space for a, for a um, winged euonymus, uh, I'd much rather plant something um, much more butterfly friendly in there. Uh, I'd probably park um, another bunch of gel pie weeds or something in, into that space instead. Um, Julie was interested in knowing how your gardens and the natives um, handled the drought this summer. Did they require um, watering or how did you handle that? We have um, an area in our backyard, which is close to the house, uh, which um, has a pergola in it and, you know, shade for a, an outdoor table and things. And, um, and our essentially our kitchen garden, which we don't do. There's so many excellent, you know, local places to get good fruits and vegetables that I don't do vegetable gardening anymore, but we're both really into cooking and we love having fresh herbs. And so um, uh, I did water those pots and other sort of decorative things, which are immediately on our back patio. But other than that, I didn't do any watering. Um, and uh, it was not a good summer for, um, uh, I noticed fewer uh, of fewer of everything really than we have had in previous years. And uh, if it turns out that this was not um, uh, uh, anomalous and that it's going to be the new normal uh, to have a really serious drought in July and August. Um, uh, and even you know, we have a pool. So pools are, are great heat sinks. And we notice um, that August is always distinctly cooler than July. So you think of August as a high summer month, but it's actually cooler than July, but not this year. Um, 
Uh, and so this year I'm hoping was enough, uh, you know, the climate's been warming for a long time. So things getting warmer is not th that unusual and droughts in especially Southern New England, at least moderate droughts in the late summer aren't that unusual, but this was a bad year. And the short answer is I didn't do anything extraordinary to try to water the lawn um, or even a lot of our uh, flower beds. And um, we have well water, so we can't be extravagant with water to begin with. So the um, short answer is no, um, our stuff shriveled up the way everyone else's did. We have a couple of questions about getting started with uh, doing pollinator gardening in uh, someone's own yard. Uh, Rob has a new house that's mostly, mostly lawn, exclusively purslane. Uh, they're not interested in using herbicides or typical grass lawn, but they want to know how to get to have pollinator plantings. Uh, and Diana is asking, uh, when you stop mowing for a new designated pollinator bed, how do you break through the turf to plant natives and other perennials to add interest? Do you just dig them in? Yes. I just, they kind of tied together. Sorry. Yeah, I, I just dig them in. So um, the way we created our pollinator beds is just as an exper uh, experiment, I don't know, maybe six years ago now, I just stopped mowing certain areas. I just... Um, picked out a big square and uh, mowed around it and just started letting the grass grow. So other people have done more elaborate things, uh, picked out a bed and rototilled it and did a lot of plantings and whatnot. I did not do that. Uh, I just stopped mowing to see what would happen. And um and, and you get a lot of tall grass and there's many critters that just love that all by itself. Um, uh, and, but I decided I wanted a wider variety of things. And so I did two things. One was to go to the garden center and get inexpensive um, cone flowers and, and salvia and other kinds of things, uh, asters for the fall and, and dug them in. Um, it's not especially easy to dig in a lawn that's never been rototilled or anything. I have, um, I'd highly recommend uh, a Japanese gardening hatchet, which is great for breaking up sod. And I just plant them. Uh, um, uh, um, I will water them for the first couple of weeks or so just to get them going. But other than that, um, um, nothing. So uh, we've got these grassy areas. I spike them with wildflowers and whatnot just to make them look nicer. And that's about it. Um, and, and they've been going for probably six years now. Um, the only other thing I do is things like sumacs and other, uh, other woody things will try to get into the beds. And I just use a machete and, and chop them down. Um, and uh, I have a, um, a hedge trimmer that I use to trim down uh, things like mugwort and, um, and ragweed because I don't want to promote those. They're, they're wind pollinated, which is why we, they cause allergies. So they're irrelevant to bees and butterflies and things. And I just rather not um, produce a big patch of mugwort uh, uh, or ragweed. Um, so I do cut those out. But other than that, I really don't groom them at all, aside from uh, periodically adding more coneflowers or whatever to the mix, just to make them more interesting and a, and a bit nicer to look at. Uh, so, uh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, it was simplicity itself. Just stop mowing an area and see what happens. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a good idea for you, Rob, asking how to get started and, and you don't want to use herbicides, I would start by just stop. We milk. have neighbors with conventional lawns on either side of us. And, and we've talked to both of them about it. And as I say, our pollinator beds are very closely trimmed. They have hard edges. Um, it's, it's, they do not, you know, it, uh, people may be puzzled about what exactly we're up to, uh, but it's very deliberate looking. So, um, uh, you know, it's not as if you have to let your whole lawn um, uh, uh, go to a wild meadow and maybe alienate some of the neighbors. Um, 
uh, but at this point, um, although I haven't converted anybody in the neighborhood, um, I, I, nobody's ever objected to the way things look. So it, um, maybe we've just been lucky, but um, our, our pollinator beds are very deliberate looking. Uh, so it doesn't look like we've just abandoned an area of the yard. Um, Susan had a question. She wanted to know if you'd looked into a certified backyard habitat program and does that exist in, in Connecticut? I've seen signs for various things. Um, we haven't. Uh, I'm not, um, you know, I'm not trying to earn a merit badge in, in butterflies or anything. So um, uh, uh, we follow all, all many of the same recommendations. We do not fertilize. So I don't want to be poisoning the local waterways and whatnot. And we certainly don't put any herbicides or 2,4-D or other kinds of things down in our lawn. We haven't done that in the 25 years um, that we've had the yard. We were fortunate in that our big, um, uh, mostly beautiful conventional lawns, except when there's a drought, um, uh, uh, seems to do very well on its own uh, because it's, it's sitting over a leaching field. And so it seems to have, you know, plenty of food from that. But, um, uh, and uh, of course we get uh, um, dandelions and I don't object to dandelions. I think they look nice. So, uh, and we have clover, uh, which I'm happy to encourage, uh, but um, mostly aside from cutting the lawn, we don't pay a lot of attention to it. And we certainly don't, you know, use chem lawn or, you know, I, I think it has a different name now, but it's the same awful stuff. Uh, um, so we don't do that. Um, but if you like a nice big lawn and you want, you know, room for the kids to play and whatnot, um, have a nice big lawn and you can still set aside areas that are friendlier for bees and butterflies and whatnot. I think there's um, pollinator pathways has uh, you can get, you can do a certified, you can register your yard as a pollinator pathway and some towns have local pollinator pathways like Lyme we have the Lyme pollinator pathway and you can get like a little medallion or a plaque to put in your yard if you want to or you can just register it with the organization or you can just go to pollinatorpathway.org and and follow along with um, suggested methods of how to manage and maintain your space to be a pollinator pathway. There's also, I think National Wildlife Federation has a certified wildlife habitats uh, in like backyard habitats and you can get little signs too for your backyard. They're certified backyard habitats. They have that too. I'm sure there's a bunch of other ones too, but those are like nationwide uh, type of things that you can get for your own backyard, even here in Connecticut. <laughs> Yeah, I'd certainly encourage you, especially if you're just starting out, it could be a great way to collect information is yeah. what kinds of things you can do. And then you can decide, you know, your your time and money budgets, um, what things are are um, compatible. Uh, but you could start as we did really simply is just designate some areas that that might be nice um, and stop mowing. them. Right, right. Um, Julie had an interesting question. She wanted to know if we, if you had found any issues with uh, bird baths increasing mosquitoes in your yard. No. Um, uh, uh, well, especially this summer, they were very attractive, but I had to keep filling them because they dry out almost instantly. So they were not um, uh, uh, a danger of mosquitoes. Yeah, it's it's a good point. Is you don't want any kind of standing water on your property. Uh, um, that is untended, um, say old tires, um, uh, buckets that have been left around and whatnot, that kind of thing will encourage um, mosquitoes. We don't have any of that. If, if anything, our yard is too dry. Uh, um, so, so especially in a, in a year like this year. So fortunately we, um, even, you know, we've got a fire pit and we use that sometimes in the evenings and whatnot. And, and it's, it's very rarely a problem for us. We're up on a hill, so it's breezy and we're dry. So there's no place for them to breed. 
Um, everybody says, started. thank you. Great presentation. Uh, and uh, Wendy had a question. Do you, how do you keep your bird bath clean? Oh, probably mm -hmm. just um, uh, rinsing it constantly is, is they'll dry out, especially in a, in a year like this year. And I just um, let, uh, um, when I'm watering the rest of the garden, cause they, they are in our little backyard flower and herb garden is um, just run water through them. I don't, I haven't really done anything. I haven't really probably done as much as I should to, you know, clean them out and whatnot, but we have gravel in them. I, I just um, sluice water through them. Uh, uh, until the water's clear. And then I leave a bunch of water. And as I said, I put gravel in them because they're a little too deep, even for say things like goldfinches and whatnot, um, unless you put something like gravel in them. And the gravel's great because butterflies, bees, and the smaller birds can perch on the gravel and have plenty of access to the water without falling in. Excellent. Everybody says, thank you. Thank you. This was great. Thank you. Very inspiring. Um, I think that's it for our questions. Patrick, I want to thank you for joining us this afternoon. Thank you, everybody, for uh, joining us as well. We had over 30 people come in and out. Uh, we did record it, so we will post the link uh, so people can watch it again and refer back to it. And um, no, with no further questions, any closing remarks from you, Patrick? I'm um, just thanks very much for having me and uh, um, hello, Dr. Dieter Saul. Um, I remember that name from when I worked at uh, med school years ago. So um, anyway, uh, thanks very much for having me. Okay, excellent. Everybody have a great Sunday afternoon and an excellent week. Okay. Take care.